Okay, good morning everybody or whatever time it is, wherever you are, to uh, webinar number two for the Charles Darwin Evolution in Tropical Australia MOOC here in, uh, at Charles Darwin University. And this week, uh, to do part two, we're talking about evolution of evolution. So just briefly, uh, for people who couldn't make it uh, last, last week's session, uh, my name's uh, Dr. Steve Reynolds and I'm a, a lecturer and researcher here at Charles Darwin University in Darwin. Uh, my main interest is really uh, herpetology, so reptiles and amphibians, uh, but also birds. And uh, I guess I'm interested in, in natural history uh, as much as anything. Um, and I'd like to introduce Keith. Yep, my name's uh, Keith Christian. I'm Professor of Zoology here at, Col at uh, Charles Darwin University. And uh, I'm also a herpetologist or physiological ecologist. And um, um, like Steve, um, enjoy natural history, but uh, in, all, in all the work that both of us do, evolution is sort of the backbone of, of what we do, and sort of the backdrop. Yeah. So uh, this week or today, so in, in this webinar, so for part two, uh, we're going to cover some points of interest uh, from part two and maybe talk about some aspects of things that we perhaps didn't cover uh, that much actually in, in the MOOC. Um, we also want to look at there's some things that have come out of the forum, so that's good. There's been people contributing to the forums uh, during the week. And we'll provide some opportunities. So there's a couple of things you can do. You can you can use live chat, and I've noticed uh, lots of people are using the chat already, so that's great. Um, so the panel will give you chat access as soon as you log in. And so at any time, if you've got questions, and we'll try to address some of those questions as we go, um, as, as they come up. Um, and also we will be doing uh, some polling. So we'll have a few questions as we go through which we're asking people to respond to. So there's the chat. I think everyone's found the chat box by now. Just type it in there, press enter, and away we go. Um, so the other thing is now with the polling, during the webinar we'll ask a few questions. We'll have some uh, activities. So there's a polling response menu that you can see um, just above the chat there. And it's got this little button here. Uh, you can see here on the right is the one that you need to use. You can put your hand up if you like. That's the one next to it. But this one, so it'll either be a yes, no response, or it might be a multiple choice, like an ABC sort of thing. So um, select your response, put that in there, and then um, we'll see what, what, people's, um, what people's responses are to some of the questions. Yeah, I'll just say, and we we'll probably want to do that pretty quickly so we'll keep things moving. But yeah. So once you yeah. thought about it a, a few seconds, we'll yeah. poll and then we'll so keep going. We'll talk about it a bit, but as soon as you think you've come up with an answer, then you know, feel free to, to do that. All right, so what have we done in part two? Well, um, hopefully everyone's had a look at this. We've had the... Uh, We've talked about evolutionary ideas and how they've changed over time, so in the timeline. And that's people that have talked about evolution, but also things like, um, for example, uh, ge geologists and so on have talked about, you know, that, uh, so we've understood the length of time that the Earth existed, things like that. Um, taxonomy, so the way that people have classified organisms, that's changed a lot over time, going back to people like Linnaeus. So that's the first part. We looked at the origin of species and, and the structure of the origin. And, and Darwin's speaking about natural selection and artificial selection. Um, we've also talked about the theory of evolution and the Galapagos finches interactive. So hopefully everyone's had a look at that and the different um, bill shapes and so on and the different ways that they feed. Uh, and evolution, evidence for evolution and how this actually is a really um, a unifying theory in biology and it helps us make sense of so many things in biology. Um, so. Hopefully everyone's had a, had a good look at all those parts of the um, part two. So, all right, we'll go to our first activity. So, as I mentioned, if you use the poll buttons, so what we're wondering about is if we're thinking about species, um, do, we, do we think of species as distinct entities? Are they um, specific you know, items or groups of things that have characteristics in common that we can separate and uh, differentiate them from, from other things that, you know, that we might call species. Because we think about things like a genus or a family that are groups uh, of, of different types of organisms. But the species is a, it's sort of its own, it's its own category. It's, it's kind of unusual. Um, so what do people think? 
Um, do, are, are species, are they, are they distinct entities? What do people think? So we give people a couple more seconds. Five seconds. Yeah, yeah. yeah most people have, have um, said what they think. So what have we got for the response there? Okay, so, um, well, about half people have said yes. <laughs> so they do think they're, they're distinct entities. Um, some people have said no. I think um, part of the issue with with uh, with species is the idea of um, actually being able to say what a species is. And if we think back to we spoke about the um, the biological species concept. There's several species concepts. In fact, there's a whole range of them. Um, and this idea that goes back to people like Ernst Mayer and so on that members um, are a group like a population, members of a population, and they can interbreed and produce fertile offspring. And that's a way that we can define species and know that they are species. But what that suggests is that there's discontinuity. So there's whole groups of organisms that can interbreed and that can produce offspring, but they are, they can't interbreed with others. So that's that's what helps define those things as species. And that's the biological species concept is kind of useful, but I think one problem we have in the taxonomists often come against is that how do we actually know if we have a distinct species or a taxonomist would call it a, a good species? And in practice, actually applying the, the biological species concept can be quite hard. Yeah. I um, think a, a, a key word there is concept. So it, we are really, uh, people like to uh, compartmentalize things. Mm. And uh, I think that, you know, I, I probably would have voted yes on that, that they are discrete. Yeah. Is, but it's certainly not perfect. There are, there are hybrids between species, in, that, in which case, you, you know, um, sometimes you don't have uh, perfect barriers between species, and as I think you're about to show us, so yeah. talk about the, the, the part of that has to have, has to do with time since uh, divergence. Yeah. So someone there actually mentioned in the in the chat about it's, perhaps it's a matter of degrees of relatedness, and that's I guess what I want to talk about here is if um, this is an example. This think about this idea of a species, and this is what you know maybe taxonomists have to think about, and so on. If we think we start with species A here, and if we think about over some period of time, and this might be hundreds of generations or thousands of generations, or Darwin had in his in the Origin of Species, for example, we had a diagram which suggested there might be thousands of generations, but it could be, you know, we're talking about millions of years, for example, so it could be very long periods of time. And if we start out with species A, and it follows some sort of trajectory over time, and then at some point, perhaps, the two populations become separated. And so we get some sort of level of divergence. And we've spoken about the allopatric model or the ge geographic speciation where the population gets isolated from uh, a population of the same species and they gradually diverge. So depending on where we look along this time, so if we at this time period here and we think about, um, you know, when we look at organisms where it's a slice of time, they're, they're evolving all the time. This process is ongoing. So if we look at this first time period here, um, we'd say, okay, they're all the same species. Uh, this is just all one group in one area. If we cut this time here, we might say, well, they've differentiated to, a, to an extent. Um, but they, oops, if we can I'm just try and type some things here. At this point here, we might say that um, this is a, uh, a subspecies or a, uh, a variety. So there's different things that people call it or a race. So, and these are different terms that people have for things that um, look sort of similar, but there's some sort of differences. But we suspect that they can still interbreed. So we're saying, well, they're, they're still the same species, but they're different enough that we call them something else. So this example here, this is a, a, a golden whistler, and this is a species that occurs in Australia. And so there's two recognised subspecies. There's pectoralis and fuliginosa. One occurs in the southwest of Australia, and one occurs in eastern Australia. 
and they're isolated by the fact that the, the, the Malibor in between has separated those populations for a fairly long period of time. And in that period, they have all certain differences. The plumage is slightly different, a little bit of differences in the colour, and some things like call differences. So we recognise those as, as subspecies. If we went along a bit further and cut, say, at this point here, we might say, well, actually, now we have uh, a separate species. It might say species A and species B. And in fact, with the golden whistler, um, there's lots of different races and subspecies, but in northern Australia where we live, in the mangroves, there's a mangrove golden whistler, which we presume evolved from the golden whistler, and it actually recognises a different species. It's sufficiently different that we actually consider it uh, a different species. So, it's, uh, yeah, just to reiterate that I think, you know, the way, where the species concept sort of falls down or it's a bit ambiguous is really just reflecting the fact that it's a work in progress. Evolution is, is yeah. hasn't all happened and now we're here. It's, yeah. it's still happening and, yeah. and uh, we're in, in different, spe different species are in different stages of that separation from their most yeah. recent ancestors. Yeah. So that process is really ongoing and you know, then you get a genus and a family and you know, these higher orders of, of things that have diverged more and more over time. Um, so I guess so in the practical sense, the other thing with the, with the biological species concept is really um, you need to ideally get two species and see if they interbreed, which is really not very practical in many cases. And so what taxonomous people do, so people in museums and so on, is they really look at things like, for example, morphology. So you might look at the coloration. Um, if you're looking at lizards, you might count the number of scales. Um, so you measure things and you look at, you know, look at different characteristics and try to find some sort of characteristic that differentiates them. Now, here we have an uh, example of some skinks, and these are just really small uh, wall skinks. This is the genus Cryptoblepharus, which is a great name, I love that name. And they very look very similar. So this is the species here, Cryptoblepharus signatus, this one, which this is just the one we get in Darwin. It's very common, just on tree trunks, and you see it in parks and places. This is a closely related species. And they're very similar, like there's very few differences. The patterns on the backs are similar. They're all kind of small, slender things that climb up walls and climb up trees and so on. And for a long time in Australia, there was seven recognised species. Now, um, Paul Horner, who's a taxonomist at the, at the museum in Darwin, spent eight years, something like that, working on this group, trying to differentiate the different species. And on the basis of some genetic data, so he realised actually genetically, you start looking at genetics, that they look, they're actually different. And then if you go back to them, you can find little characteristics. It might be the number of scales under the longest toe or some little difference in the coloration. Um, but he realised that rather than seven species, there's actually 24 species of these skinks. And so although they look very similar, um, they're genetically distinct, they're distinct enough that they don't interbreed and so they are actually distinct species. Mm -hmm. I just might mention about that genetic analysis is a relatively new tool at least in, you know, over the life, lifetime of taxonomy. Yeah. <coughs> so um, <coughs> in the last 20 years or so, <coughs> excuse me, or a bit more than that, um, but relatively recently, recent past, a lot of different new kind of techniques that have mm -hmm. been getting right at the, at the DNA and looking at and try to, to distinguish species on that on that basis. And for the most part, I'd say that's more or less, that sort of work is more or less backed up the kind of work that's done, been done on morphology. Um, occasionally, something different comes out with uh, sort of what you call cryptic species, species, species that are very similar uh, on the outside, but are actually different uh, genetically, and, that, and that's, that sometimes shows up with its new techniques. Yeah. That's right, and the genetic data really, in a way, has, has transformed a lot of things. But it is just another another sort of data that people use to really differentiate uh, species and to figure out taxonomy. So um, one thing we haven't spoken about as much is, is phylogenies, <coughs> and I just put this up example here, um, actually from an article in Nature. And again, this is people who use basically genetic data to uh, differentiate different groups, and as you can see, these give you these um, the lengths of these uh, these 
parts here give you some idea of the relatedness. And you can see, for example, uh, dogs and humans and mouse, they're all placental mammals. They're all related here in this group. So again, it falls out like the sorts of things that we've said that people knew from morphology. Here's the marsupials. So this is based on genetic data, but it tells us the same thing. They're a separate group. And then we have here um, the platypus. And someone actually mentioned uh, the platypus in one of the forums. Um, and I was suggesting that um, I think the thing about the platypus is it, it, it is a mammal, but it's kind of an, an early offshoot. Yeah. yeah, they're a primitive mammal. So um, <clears throat> all mammals evolved from, from uh, reptiles, uh, and reptiles, the, the, the mammals that they, sorry, the reptiles that mammal, mammals evolved from laid eggs. And so uh, <clears throat> the monotremes, or the platypus, are an early offshoot of that, of that um, group, and then later came the, the placentals and the, and the marsupials. Mm -hmm. So the, um, um, yeah, they're all mammals, but but uh, they're, they're a more primitive group of mammals and share some some other. In fact, if you look at the skeleton, the morphological features, <clears throat> there are also some other um, reptilian characteristics mm -hmm. as well. Skin on, but and they lay eggs, which I must admit is is very odd. <laughs> a mammal to lay eggs. Um, the other thing that's interesting is that um, is this idea we have here: the reptiles, and then we have the birds. And one thing that people had sort of suggested that birds were just a kind of a reptile in a way, and the genetic data really seems to back that up. They're just a form of a reptile that evolved wings and feathers and learned to fly. Yeah, but very, very closely related to the dinosaurs, in fact. Yeah. And some people would say they're just they're the modern day dinosaurs. Yeah, so maybe the dinosaurs do, do still sort of exist. Um, this paper was actually written in relation to trying to figure out the ancestor to the tetrapods. The tetrapods are all the land dwelling four limbed animals, everything we think of um, reptiles, amphibians, birds and mammals. Um, and actually suggest that the lungfish is possibly the more closely related to the tetrapod ancestor than, than the coelacanth, this weird uh, primitive thing. So this this phylogeny is at a very high high level, in other words, big groups. Yeah. But others are other kinds of phylogenetic trees are much more detailed and look at species or even subspecies and I think we'll look at one yeah. of those now. And this, yeah, this is an example of something um, from the uh, University of Texas where the uh, the Tree of Life project and so lots of people are drawing these trees now. You see lots of phylogenetic trees everywhere. People are examining relationships <coughs> using genetic data. And this one is, is particularly amazing because they've used something like 3,000 species in this tree. and. If you can see here, you've got uh, you've got bacteria down the bottom. Uh, you've got protists, so uh, single single celled animals. Uh, there's a whole group of plants here. So this this whole section here is all plants. And over here is the animals. So and this tiny little thing here, if you can see, this says you are here. And this point here on this phylogeny is where people fit in to this whole, you know, 3,000 species. Um, and so this fits in well as well with this idea of the five kingdoms that people talk about. So you've got fungi, protists, plants, animals, and bacteria. And actually the break in the phylogeny occurs here. So it leads down to this point here somewhere. And so that's the differentiation between the, the prokaryotes, so the bacteria, and, and the eukaryotes, um, which is all the you know, multicellular animals and all those sorts of things. So, they are doing some really amazing things with, with genetic data and you know, any, there's loads of papers about phylogenies and, and all these things. It's, it's, there's an awful lot of that stuff coming out. So yeah, so that's sort of making the whole field more interesting. All right, so that's that. We wanted to then go on um, to, the, to the next part, which is to talk about um, different types of selection. <coughs> so we've spoken a little bit about natural selection and artificial selection in the um, in the MOOC itself, we'll talk about. Yeah, okay, let's just talk a little bit about each of these. Artificial selection, Darwin talked about artificial selection, and in fact, he used the, uh, his pigeons that he raised, and, and there were a lot of pigeon fanciers uh, in England at the time, and probably still are. And they select the specific characters, characteristics that they like in a pigeon, and then maybe it's coloration or the type of plumage. And then they would breed similar ones, and then eventually you get really very different ones. And and this is a this is a, a concept that ever is really 
everyone's really familiar with, even if you don't think of it in those terms, because we have domesticated animals. So if you think about dogs uh, ranging from Chihuahuas to Great Danes, they're all dogs, but, but they're very different, and that's um, directly a result of uh, artificial selection. And so it's 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 if someone says you know uh, I don't believe in evolution. Well, these are things that have happened over very. This this is this is an example of evolution mm-hmm. by artificial selection as opposed to evolution by natural selection. Mm-hmm. And I, just really quickly, another example looking at dogs is uh, back in the 1870s or 1880s in in Germany there was a, a tax collector who wanted to breed it wanted some dogs to help protect him while he collected his, his uh, taxes. And he specifically picked dogs with different characteristics. And over a relatively short period of time, 10 to 15 years, he developed the Doberman. And the Doberman is, you know, still breeds very true as, a, uh, as long as you breed them with Dobermans. They have very distinct behaviors, very distinct morphological characteristics. And so that was a, a case of artificial selection, uh, very targeted ar- artificial selection that happened in a, a really short period of time. And so um, that's one type of evolution. Evolution is, is change. And natural selection is a, a similar process. The only, the only difference is the uh, selective force. So in artificial selection, humans are the selective force who actively choosing characteristics they like, whereas in natural selection, nature, the, the environment, the, the rainfall, salinity, um, food availability, predators, and so on, are all, all of these sorts of factors are things that, that unconsciously select characteristics and those that have the best ability to survive and therefore reproduce are the ones that uh, uh, that pass on the genes, their genes to the next generation, and it's it's really as, as simple as that. Um, one of uh, Huxley, uh, one of Darwin's contemporaries, Huxley, wrote after he read Darwin's first exposé or his first uh, uh, scientific paper describing evolution by natural selection. Huxley said something like. Well, this is so simple. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I feel stupid for not thinking of it I myself. I don't think of it. Yeah, it's such a basic idea, but yeah. Yeah. And so uh, those are two types of sex- selection that we've talked about. Mm-hmm. We're going to talk about the next three uh, now. Talk about sexual selection, which is again just a, a form of natural selection. Mm-hmm. It's not completely different. It's just a, a specialized form where you have, you have a different selective force. The selective force in this case might be, for example. Uh, make choice. So uh, one sex, usually the females, are much more discerning than, than, than the males, and they choose mates. And that that's, that results in a selective force. The mates that have the characteristics that are most often chosen by the females are the ones that tend to, to uh, reproduce more and leave more offspring into the future. There's another aspect to that that's not mate choice, and that's has to do with combat, so it, it may think of animals that have, hair, have harems, such as uh, elephant seals, walruses, a lot of a uh, lot of the seals and sea lions, uh, and and also also uh, uh, deer. For example, they have combat where they clash their antlers and push on push on each other, and so the antlers are very much a part of that. The antlers. <clears throat> In deer are only found in the males, and they are a result of sexual selection. Yeah. <clears throat> so that sort of male um, sexual, sexual ornaments and so on, like they have in plumage and bright colours and things like that. <clears throat> yeah, a lot of birds are the males are more brightly coloured than the females, and that's a result of sexual selection. Sexual selection. Well, just mention the other. <clears throat> the other two. The other two there you wanted to talk about. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll talk about just mention those very briefly now, and then we'll talk about them a bit later. Kin selection is selection of families, and group selection is sort of, and of course families are groups, so kin selection is a very specific type of group selection where you look at, rather than the selection is at the family level rather than the individual level, yeah. group selection takes that idea 
a step farther and maybe a step too far. A lot of evolutionary biologists would say that, that it's a step too far, and that looks at selection among groups that are not necessarily closely related. We'll, we'll talk about more of those more. In so, just talking about this idea then of um, we've mentioned natural selection. Obviously, we've talked a bit about that a fair bit. But this idea of sexual selection. So, wanting people, we've got a couple of examples here um, where we look at. So as we've mentioned, sexual selection, where it might be mate, mate choice, um, females might choose males, or males might actually compete with each other for females. So in these sorts of examples, do you think this is largely due to um, sexual selection or natural selection? Or maybe it's, it's actually some combination of the two. So the first example we have here is uh, the, the peafowl. So I imagine most people would have seen these um, amazing uh, ornamental feathers that they have, very bright plumage. And again, this is something that happens in the males. Uh, so the males display uh, to the females. And we presume that, that you know, a bigger, brighter male might, might help um, in, in getting matings and things like that. So, um, so people, what, what do people think about this on uh, sexual selection, natural selection, or maybe, maybe a combination of the two? So the, what's he called? The, pe the peacock, is it? Peacock. And then the peacock's the, the male and the, and the pea hen. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So let's see what people think. <coughs> so what have we got there? Okay. Yeah. Sexual selection. Yeah, definitely a lot of people thinking sexual selection. Yeah. Well, I think we probably have to go with that. So yeah, okay. that's right. So everyone's pretty pretty clued into that. So. <laughs> There's the, the male there um, demonstrating. In this case, actually, the female doesn't look that interested. But um, it's so you know it's it's selecting for very bright plumage males with these sorts of characteristics are likely to get more matings, and as a result, they're likely to pass on their genes to the next generation. Yeah. So I definitely agree with that uh, with, the, with the majority there. But, yeah. uh, but there's another sort. There may be some. Um, <clears throat> Artificial selection in, in there as well, because uh, right. these are, at least except in India and places where where they're a wild bird, mm -hmm. they're a domesticated bird, and everybody knows what we can do with domesticated birds. You have uh, budgery gars, the budgies in in uh, in the wild are pretty much one color or you know one greenish color, and you go to a pet store, they're it's just about any kind of different want. colors. That's right. And that's all artificial selection. Yeah. So maybe the really bright plumage is partly due to sort of artificial selection. The other thing is that, um, in a sense, the, the tail can become sort of fairly enormous, but when it gets really big, it's, it's actually hard for these birds to fly. And they're ground birds, but still. So there's probably actually some limit to how large this can get before the actual bird cannot yeah. fly at all. So there's, there's, that's, and that's kind of a yep, so selection pressure, really. It's a, it's a natural selection pressure. So <clears throat> in that case, um, when they start pushing up against that limit of, of getting so big that you, you know, have a hard time getting around and collecting food, then that, that's working in, in opposition to sexual selection. The, male, the females may be preferring those really big, big tails, but uh, tail feathers, but it, if it gets too hard, so there's got to be, at any one time, there'll be some sort of balance yeah. between sexual selection and natural selection on, on, on the, uh, their ability to get around. And this has actually been demonstrated uh, in, in, in nature in some birds. One particular one that, that study that I'm familiar with is uh, a, a boat tail grackle in North America. And these, they don't, the tails are nothing like, like, a, like a peacock tail, but they're quite a, the males have a much bigger tail that they use than the females, and they use that in displays. And it, people have tracked that over time, and the tails get you know, a bit larger, larger, and larger. Then something happens, a, a big winter or a big storm, mm -hmm. and all the big-tailed birds sort of get blown away and, mm -hmm. and uh, really can't handle that, those conditions. And yeah. so it goes back to a shorter tail, slightly so shorter tail, mm -hmm. and then, you know, in between the storms, the, the tails might get a bit longer. So it's always a balance. A bit of a balance between us, right. So, yeah, so the bird that was a boat tail grackle to North, North America. But I, I, there's actually been some work, more uh, recent work on this, done in um, in Galapagos, on Galapagos finches, where mm -hmm. we looked at some of the 
beak size characteristics and so forth that have, have changed over rel rel relatively short periods of time. Um, so we had a, another example here then of a similar sort of thing and again a uh, question about whether this is really largely due to sexual selection or natural selection or both and this in this example we have this ornate burrowing frog and you can see it's very ornate back pattern here and I've included this photograph here because you can see this is where uh, frogs actually buried it. You can actually just see one eye here, there's the snout and there's the other eyeball. So this is a um, these ones, this particular species often buries in sand and this is what it does, it buries, all it can see is just the top of its head and so I think as a, as a predator or something it'd probably be really hard to um, for that to see. So um, people will have a um, vote on this about whether they think this is more uh, sexual selection or natural selection or maybe maybe a bit of a combination. So let's see what people have said. A couple more seconds, oh, there we go. So again, looks like people are pretty much um, thinking along the right the right lines. Um, really, this is if we're thinking about uh, it's a way of, of escaping predators and not being eaten. And we talked a little bit about fitness, um, but the, basically the fitness of an animal if you get eaten, then your fitness drops to zero very quickly. So um, predation is a very strong selection pressure, and so. If you can hide from your uh, predators, then that's a really good way of surviving. And in order to reproduce, you need to survive. That's sort of like the first thing. So um, this is another example of a, of a frog with uh, with camouflage. This is also another species that occurs in in the, in the Northern Territory near Darwin. And as you can see, um, particularly at night time, this, this, this colour pattern that it has against the background of leaves and grass and things like that, uh, these things are actually pretty hard to see and they're very hard to find if you go looking for them in the wet season. So it's another example of, of camouflage. A couple of points in the, um, in the, in the discussion about those. One, one people's, one, somebody has raised a point about humans and saying that uh, human females are more beautiful um, and may present themselves better. Uh, that may be true, I won't comment on whether it's true or not, but I'll just make the point that no matter whether that's true or not, it's still, I would say, very much the case that that uh, females make are making the choice most of the time. I mean, I remember when I was in graduate school, uh, someone gave me a, a, um, a seminar and, and about sexual selection and said, "If you don't, if you just think about this as a thought experiment," and he said, "I'll bet anything that every woman in this audience could go out downtown and stand on the street and find a sexual partner within an hour." And I bet there's no man in this audience that could go out in one hour and yeah. find a sexual partner. So, you know, that's that's just a thought experiment. So I think there's still, uh, you know, the same sorts of processes yeah. of, of, of of selection are, are still operating in humans. That's right. Yeah, and it's interesting to think again from you know what people might have evolved from and and what sort of um, what sort of mating systems and so on they have in those in, in apes and so on. So um, we. So just as a last sort of a question here, again with this one up here about this uh, bowerbird and these are very unusual and, and Stephen Garnett talks about this in, in part four of this mm -hmm. course. Um, but these are very unusual, these, these bowers and there's um, ten species of bowerbird that occur in Australia and they all construct these bowers, not all exactly like this type but the one we have in northern Australia is the great bowerbird and it's kind of a brown drab looking bird, it's not particularly um, brightly coloured. But what they do do is they construct these bowers and this is they stick all these twigs into the ground. This one here you can see it's got uh, shells. This one's actually found bits of glass because it's, it's in suburbia. Uh, rocks, uh, there's little bits of plastic. There's all sorts of things that it's gone and collected and they have to be the right colour. You know, they have some sort of aesthetic sense or something. Um, and they place them in the bowers and then they call and they make all sorts of weird, strange hissing noises and chuckling and they also do mimicry so they, they use calls of other, other birds as well as they have quite a big uh, vocal repertoire and they try to attract females uh, to the bower. So, and the actual, the mating um, actually takes place in the bower and then that's sort of the end of the male's involvement because the female then actually um, builds a nest and, and incubates the eggs and does all that, those sorts of things. So, um, 
think we managed to vote on this one. We'll see what we can do. Yeah, let's get the results. Yep. So the results. Yep, sexual selection. So, yeah, again, this is a, a result of sexual selection that's not, not a morphological trait, not like big antlers or big tail feathers in a peacock, but it's a behavioral trait. And um, it's all about mating. There's no real, there's no other function of this, of this structure. They don't, it's not a nest. Yeah. And, and it's, it's all about the courtship behavior. And uh, so the males... Um, or use that as a display area. And it, it's interesting to you know, just like any other character, like, there's diversity. So if you, you can see some differences in those two. Mm. They still, but predominantly for this particular species, they like white and green. This one's got more shells. Yeah, but yeah. The, uh, other species of bowerbirds like other, prefer other colors. But, uh, yeah. but, but still, there's, there's, there's a different shape to them. The, the arch of, of twigs is a, is a bit different. One has a big platform out in the front, so there, there's variation, and that's, of course, that's that's the stuff of evolution. Variation that okay. allows the females. Well, what are the females like? Big front porches, or do they don't, they don't care about? Front do they like more green or less green? Yeah, so uh, so it's it's really it's interesting that this is really a, a characteristic that's the result of sexual sexual selection, but it's not a morphological characteristic; it's a behavioral characteristic. That's right. So it's really acting on the on the behaviour. Um, the the last one, and we just wanted to mention briefly, is the the Irish elk, which um, actually became extinct in the Pleistocene. But these were large deer, basically, and they had absolutely enormous antlers. Um, and the the thinking is that these were probably involved in some sort of display, either a battle, so as we mentioned, um, between males. Or in fact, these might because they're so large, it might have largely been a display thing. So, um, in some animals, they, in, in a way, actually to avoid combat, they they display, and then um, so one of the males would become dominant, and that might be enough just the fact that he has big antlers, and then he has more matings with, with females and so on. So, the, the, the amazing thing about deer is these the antlers are only in males, and they grow them every year. So these. Something, yeah. A structure this size grows yeah. in half a year. They use it for a couple of months in, in the mating season, and then they drop off, and then they start the whole process again. So when you think about the energy involved in that, the commitment of the calcium uh, that's required to, to do that every year, yeah. it, it, uh, it's, it's an enormous cost. And it, like I'm not, I'm not sure about the Irish elk, whether they use it more in fighting or whether it's display, like to, to attract the females. But, but one of the ideas for some of these big ornamentations like this is that, well, why is that so attractive to a female? You know, why does why does the a pea fowl care about a big tail? And, that, and there's a, a hypothesis called the, the handicap principle, the handicap hypothesis, which suggests that. The females are saying, okay, this guy's dragging around this, all this extra weight, mm. but he's still managing to find enough food to be good and fit and strong, and so he must have good genes. And, and we're, not, we're not consciously thinking yes, this. Yeah. But, the, but the, uh, the, the, the end result is that, uh, this, you know, that, that despite all this, it's, it's a, that, that individual has good genes, yeah. and so it's worth... Um, so they're selecting one. He's obviously a survivor if he can... Yeah fly around with that massive tether or have these enormous um, handlers and so on. So that's right. And so whatever they're selecting, they probably don't know why they're selecting it, but yeah. for some reason that, you yeah. know. Now, we don't know why there are you know, when extinct. A lot of things along around that period, a lot of the Pleistocene megafauna when extinct. But there's been some suggestion that this cost might have just got, you know, one of the cases we talked about earlier where sexual selection goes a bit too far and natural selection sort of takes over and these guys sort of, yeah. uh, you know, the cost is just too much or they couldn't get between trees or something like that. Or, you know, who knows? Yeah. But uh, uh, maybe or maybe not. I mean, they're still moose today and their moose have uh, pretty big antlers yeah. but not, not quite this big. Yeah. All right, well, we just wanted to, so we mentioned that a fair bit there about sexual selection. So as we mentioned, we just want to sort of talk briefly about about kin selection and group selection. So, Keith, did you? Yeah. So, kin selection uh, was was noted by 
by Darwin in The Origin of Species. He recognized that these social insects like bees and wasps and ants, they have insect cassette that, that don't reproduce. That's the ultimate sacrifice for those individuals to make. And that's referred to sometimes as altruistic behavior. And, and altruistic behavior can be a helping kind of behavior. We'll talk about that in, in birds in a minute. But in, in the social insects, that's sort of the alt altruism taken to an extreme. They give up their own ability to, to reproduce in order to, to help the queen make more workers and, and to, for the sake of the... So we're thinking about termites and ants and colonies. Termites and ants, yeah. 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 And so um, this, this is, uh, is... Darwin recognized this as a problem, and then it, it occurred to him, I don't believe he used the words kin selection, but it, it occurred to him that, well, these things are actually not just helping the queen, they're helping themselves. They're passing on their own genes by making the, the family successful. And that's what kin selection is, is natural selection acting at the level of the family so as all, opposed to the individual. They're all very closely related, aren't they? Like they're all from the same yeah. mother, so they're all right. actually very, they share a lot of the same genes, so they're very closely related. Yeah. We actually talk about this some in part four when we talk about weaver ants. There's one, a video about weaver ants. We talk about it sort of an odd case relative to this. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the reason it works is called a, a concept called inclusive fitness, where is, is inclusive fitness is the sum of an individual's reproductive fitness plus its influence on the reproductive fitness of its close relatives. And of course, close relatives share many genes. So this one extreme is the, uh, the worker ants and bees. They don't have any individual reproductive fitness, but they have a lot of influence on the reproductive fitness. So they're all, they're, their total inclusive fitness is they're helping the queen. Yeah. But there are a lot of birds that have uh, um, cooperative breeding. So they, um, they, they, they live in groups, and some in Australia called yeah. babblers. For example, like babblers and fairy wrens and, and apostle birds. Apostle like birds, yeah. yeah. You always see them in, in groups, and these are related groups, family groups. And the young individuals stick around in the family. They help catch food. They help make the nest. They help catch food. Feed the, the next generation, yeah. their, their younger siblings. And so they're adding to their individual fitness in that way. So they may eventually become reproductive on their own right. Yeah. And so in that case, their inclusive fitness is those offspring that they produce in their later years plus the help that they gave to their siblings and parents to raise right. their so brothers and sisters. Closely related to their brothers and sisters, so yeah. they're, they're assisting them. So their in, yeah, inclusive fitness um, is likely to be... So the kin selection idea is is one that um, people have looked into quite a bit. The other one that you yeah. were talking about was group selection. Yeah, group selection is, is the same idea but taken to uh, uh, another extreme, so that looking at a selection at the level of groups and in this case, groups that are not necessarily closely related individuals. And this, is, again, is going to be to, used to explain altruism, uh, how it spreads because of the benefit of the group, even though an individual might be disadvantaged by it. So some examples are birds that give uh, a warning call of the predators. And so you might think, well, that's, that's attracting the predator to them, but the whole flock uh, and maybe maybe a multi-species flock. It's not always right. it's the same. So they're not Definitely not, not related. Not related. Yeah. But everybody benefits from that. And so um, the problem with this whole idea of group seduction is that an individual that cheats should win. And over the long period of time, in other words, individuals reproduce faster than groups do, or, or replace faster than groups do. And so it's it's hard to explain cheaters. Uh, why cheaters don't take take over? Yeah, yeah. This idea of group selection uh, in the 1960s, uh, an English scientist by the name of Wayne Edwards put it forth, and he wrote a book about it. He had a lot of examples of this uh, sort of altruistic behavior in, in animals, particularly in mammals. And almost immediately after that, there was a whole series of articles and books and people criticizing the concept, saying, "No, this." You know, uh, groups can't be the, the unit of selection. Unrelated groups can't be the units of selection. Individuals are the units of selection. 
and cheaters will always win. And there have been mathematical models uh, built around this idea. And, then, and so that was pretty much knocked down back when I was uh, studying. More recently, some of the ideas have come back uh, with more sophisticated kinds of, uh, of mathematical models yeah. to say that theoretically it's possible, but uh, it requires a specific circum set of circumstances. It's probably, uh, you know, may occur, but not very often. It's not the main sort of evolution, main factor in evolution, but it may occur. So it, it's an example of an ongoing debate. We don't know everything there is yeah. to know about evolution. About evolution, but there are other sorts of theories out there. <laughs> and um, so people are still evolutionary biologists and so on are still working on these ideas. Yeah. So anyway, something to look into, kin selection and group selection. So just to, to move on then, quick quiz. Um, which one of these is a modern evolutionary thinker? And we've had a few people uh, in the forums um, talk about uh, modern evolutionary thinkers. So we're asking about um, you know, people that they thought were important. In um, And as we've talked about, like the basic theory of evolution, the ideas of natural selection and so on, have really stood up pretty well um, to the test of time. and those basic ideas still people pretty much um, think that those theories are, are, are correct and really explain what's going on. But these are little minor modifications and, and you know, uh, particular aspects of evolution or particular circumstances like you mentioned with kin selection and group selection, uh, particular examples in particular situations where they're, they're relevant. So um, which one of these, so what have we got some answers there? A few people have, uh, well yeah, I think, I'm not sure who Jack Roberts is, I think we've done pretty well. <laughs> so, yes, Stephen Jay Gould, that's right. So he was actually a, um, a paleontologist, American paleontologist. And I think, I just wanted to say, apart from um, punctuated equilibrium, which was a theory with, with Niles Eldridge, which, um, which actually became very prominent to do with rates of change in, in the fossil record and so on, um, which people would have heard about, I think. Um, but also he wrote, and I've got an example here. This is one book. This is uh, Ever Since Darwin which is a collection of essays by, by Stephen Jay Gould. He's written a whole series of these books. Unfortunately, he passed away now, but um, I always find the Stephen Jay Gould essays to be really interesting, uh, and he has a really good take on evolution, and he understands it really well. He wrote some very difficult-to-read articles, uh, scientific articles, and some very big books about it, um, but his, his popular essays um, are really, really interesting. So uh, I would recommend people to have a look at those. Yeah, there's a, a question here I might, might just uh, yeah. briefly talk about. So, so somebody has raised an, uh, a human question. I'm not going to address that specific question because I'm not really an a anthropologist. And, but, but, but I'll just make the point that humans are, are different, and not just humans, but other, other very social animals in the sense that uh, we, we have fairly sophisticated social structure and fairly intelligent animals, that is, that they can remember individuals and so forth, you have the possibility for punishing cheaters. And so if, you, if the, the society or the group punishes a cheater mm -hmm. and excludes them in some way from, from the mating process, then, they, then the cheaters won't win. Yeah. So, so there are possible ways and very complex, and that's some of the debate, the more recent sort of ideas put forward, about group selection is that under these cer certain circumstances it's probably or it may well be possible that that groups might be the units of uh, of selection yeah. but you know it's the minority of, 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 okay. of cases. Yeah. All right we have, we've had a couple of suggestions from the forum uh, some modern evolutionary thinkers. One person mentioned um, George Gaylord Simpson and it seems we have a lot of paleontologists uh, so he was a paleontologist uh, involved in the modern synthesis and so on. So um, that's a, a good example there. Um, interest in fossil mammals and so on. And also he wrote a book, uh, Tempo and Mode in Evolution, which would have influenced actually Stephen Jay Gould and his ideas about, about punctuated equilibrium. So that's mm. interesting. Someone's also mentioned Neil Shubin, who's a more recent paleontologist, who amongst other things has discovered this fossil um, fisher pod, they call it. And what it is, it's a, an intermediate form between uh, an ancestral uh, fish, and so then the, the, the transition of fish onto land to create the, the tetrapods, so the things that we mentioned with four limbs that walk around on land. And this seems like a transitional form, a really good, it's got an intermediate sort of a limb, it's partway between a fish fin and a, and a tetrapod limb, you know, with, with this sort of 
configuration like we have and that all other tetrapods have. So that was a, a good example. Is it worth uh, saying a, bit, a little bit about punctuated equilibrium at this point? Just just to say that it's really not a different mechanism of evolution. It, it has to do with the rates of evolution. And so Darwin's idea, as Steve mentioned early on, was that evolution was very gradual and, and slow. And, and it's almost undoubtedly the case that that's often true. But then uh, Eldridge and, and uh, Stephen Jay Gould, they were paleontologists, and they said the fossil record doesn't really support that. The fossil record, for the most part, shows we're over the, a long period of time, very little change, maybe some gradual change, and then something happens, the environment changes, or um, you know, the environment changes in some way or another, and then then things really start to change, and that's the punctuated you know, the, period of rapid evolution yeah. and rapid change. They're suggesting periods of rapid change, but I mean, let's face it, they were paleontologists, so for them, yeah. a couple of million years is a period of rapid change. Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, they're still not saying like it's happening in a couple of weeks or something, but yeah, yeah they were geologists, but they did see rapid change in the, in the fossil record rather than the, the gradualism, which is what Darwin really spoke about, is everything happened with very gradual change. Mm -hmm. So, so it's, it's almost again, a case of both both are happening, yeah, it's yeah, not yeah, really it's one or the other. Modification of the, yeah. some of the ideas, but it doesn't really change the intrinsic ideas about evolution that much. Yeah. Uh, just one of my favourite modern evolution thinkers is Haldane, who was a geneticist and also a mathematician. Um, anyway, I hope people have a look there. One of his quotes, he had um, several good quotes. If you look at his um, anything about him on the internet, you'll see he's got a list of his quotes and he's a bit of, a, a bit of an interesting guy. Um, all right, well, I might just move along because um, we're sort of getting, getting close to the end. Um, we wanted to talk a little bit about evidence for evolution, which is one of the other things we uh, talked about in, in the MOOC. This was just an example of some skeletons that I thought was really fascinating because we talked about Darwin and someone mentioned in the forum about, did he mention about evolution of humans in the origin? And he didn't really mention it actually in the origin, or he did say that, that light might be thrown on the origin of man and his ancestry and so on. So he didn't really, but then in the, uh, the Descent of Man, which he wrote later, he did really go into that and actually that's basically what that book was about, or well, the other part of it was about sexual selection. But um, this is just interesting to me because these skeletons, you can see the structures, they've all got the same, you know, this, the, they've got the, the fall in here, which is basically exactly the same. They've got hands with five digits and fingers, just like we do. I even noticed that they have this, um, they don't really have tails. They've all got this little rudiment of a tail, just like, and all the apes actually don't have tails. So just this idea that, um, you know, these, they're all closely related and all structures are very similar. They're just modifications. You know, the skull of the gorilla is slightly bigger and it has a bigger jaw because it eats, you know, a lot of vegetable matter and so on. But the basic structures and everything are exactly the same. Um, so this is an example of a whale which shows the same sort of thing. I just like this photo because, um, you know, this is taller than a man. If you, if you were standing next to it, a person would, would come up to about here. You can see, just like we have, it has a shoulder bone, it has a scapula, it has a humerus, it has a radius and an ulna, and it has five digits. So even though it's a whale, it's completely different. It's got a flipper rather than a hand. It's exactly the same. It's got a backbone, it's got a rib cage, it's got everything. That, so it's not a fish, as some people thought. I think Linnaeus is classified as a fish. Um, so it's, it's very definitely a mammal one. It's very definitely a vertebrate. All right, so we just wanted to quickly do this one. Um, so we had a little activity. Um, we're thinking about vestigial organs, so organs that maybe um, things that sort of disappeared over time. And these are evidence of evolution in the sense that these are um, structures and so on that, that organisms have, but when they evolve in different directions, they may actually not use these things. So this example of, is vestigial wings. So if we think about, we've got some example here, uh, the, the emu, which obviously occurs in Australia. Um, you know, we see them in the outback. Uh, they run pretty fast but their wings are not really very useful. Uh, they, they can't possibly fly, I mean, they're too big to fly anyway. In South America, you have a similar sort of thing, which is a rhea. Um, and in New Zealand, there's actually several species of kiwis. I put in here the great spotted kiwi, which occurs on the, on the South Island. So they all have um, these little funny sorts of wings or wings that they can't use very did well. Did I just give away the answer? Did I give away the answer? Yeah, I think you did. Oh, no. <laughs> Pretty old here, but... So what have my people... <laughs> I think everyone's got it anyway. Yeah. So that's right. So this... The next one's a little bit... This one might be a bit more... Yeah, the next one might be a bit more tricky. That's right. So I think everyone got that. That wasn't too hard, was it? 
So that's right. So this idea of vestigial, so there's an example here, rudimentary, atrophied, having become functionless in the course of evolution. So these are things that they still retain these things. There's little remnants of wings, particularly in the in the kiwis, or these tiniest wings, but they're absolutely useless. So as a bird, so, okay, now we think about perhaps slightly more typical birds. So we've got an example here of a wedge-tailed eagle, and um, it can fly fairly well. But we thought we'd also include this example of, of, a, of a penguin. So there's a king penguin that occurs on uh, sub-Antarctic islands, uh, and they can swim. So they swim around to get food and so on. But the other example here is this, this um, flightless cormorant, which, which occurs on the Galapagos. So, um, so which is the vestigial wings? It's a little bit trickier than the other. Mm -hmm. We like to think it's at least slightly, slightly trickier than the last one. Let's see what we got. Let's see what people reckon. Let's see, like this common right. So no one said the eagle. That's good. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. You, you could say penguins. Yeah. So it, it's an interesting question. Uh, Penguins, and in, in the flightless cormorant is from Galapagos, and there's also a penguin in Galapagos. The Galapagos penguin is quite a much smaller one than yeah, the king, one. Penguin, king penguin. But there's two flightless birds. They both swim, um, but the flightless cormorant uses its feet to swim, whereas penguins, all the penguins, use their wings to swim. So they're not really vestigial wings. They yeah. fly. They just fly in water instead of in air. And have, so the two um, really very different ways. They do have wings, but they yeah. they really used for a different purpose. And yeah, you see yeah. them; they're kind of flying. Yeah. They, they they very much fly in yeah. the water. It's just a different yeah. medium. So uh, yeah, the, I'm not sure what the flight is common. Is his wings for? We're well, not sure, and it it's still sort of puts its wings out like it's trying to dry them or something. Even yeah, though it doesn't, doesn't really matter if they're dry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. anyway. So it's a little bit of. I mean, you know, it doesn't need to fly really because it's out on an island somewhere. So there's no real yeah, predators that can. can that can uh, take it or something like that. Um, all right, I just wanted to, this is just another example of a whale, another, another whale example, but this is another vestigial organ. So you look on a whale, and if you look at its tail, you notice it doesn't have rear limbs, but these evolve from things that have fore limbs and hind limbs, and all that's left now is this couple of little bones um, left of the whole pelvic girdle, and the hind limbs that it had. And you can see the same sorts of things in pythons where they have just a few little remnants of the hind limbs, which tells us that it evolved from a limbed ancestor that, that had those rear limbs, um, that just doesn't have it having use for them anymore, and, mm. and so it has evolved. There's actually quite a few different animals. There's legless lizards, and, you know, mm. and particularly in the reptiles, quite a that different have done kind of examples that have yeah. gotten so rid of their legs. Gotten rid of their legs entirely. Um, all right, well, look, I think we're getting pretty close to... Um, we got one more? Um, perhaps wrap it up. So I think um, we'll probably end it pretty much there. I just wanted to, to conclude and say um, thanks, everyone, for joining in the webinar today. Um, so hopefully we've talked a little bit about evolutionary theory and natural selection and people understand sexual selection and so on. I thought I'd finish with this. We've had... Um, the Galapagos finches, an example of an adaptive radiation. And it's interesting because they evolved uh, in, a, in a group of islands in the Galapagos, and we've spoken about how this was important with, with Darwin's thinking and so on, and made him think about speciation. Um, but importantly, next week, uh, and in the next webinar, we're going to be thinking about the Malay Archipelago, so where Wallace visited, and that's a whole string. There's thousands of islands in the Malay Archipelago. And you've got similar sorts of things going on there where islands are really important places where things can become isolated and then change over time and become new species and different species. So they're really important things for speciation. Actually, they help us understand a lot of ideas about um, evolutionary theory. Yeah. So the whole, the whole region between Australia and Southeast Asia is just riddled with islands. Yeah. There's a lot of interesting biology there. Yeah. And some of those islands have only, you know, come up out of the ocean floor relatively recently. So we'll have a look at that in the next week and talk to you uh, next week about, uh, about POS and, and biogeography. So thanks, everybody. Thanks.